and our team over here will help to respond appropriately. What we'll do before we even go to the questions is our national president has got an address for us. So our national president has got um, some brief remarks for us. So I'll, hand, I'll bring him onto the podium. He'll do his, his remarks, after which... We have a slide we want you to have a look at so that it will provide a framework for our discussions. So can we move to the next stage of the slide? It's just a one pager. Good. Basically, if somebody says he has a strategy, he must be able to capture it on one page. If he cannot capture it in one page, it's not a strategy. And he's not sure of what he's doing. Forget about the remarks around, because I just used it for a board meeting. But essentially, this is our strategic framework in full gospel over the last two and a half years. The first part of it, which is really the foundation of all that we believe in as leaders, is prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Without that, every other thing that we do is meaningless. There is no true sustainable success unless it is undergirded by prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit. When we came into office, God led me to choose a man who had nothing to do with prayer. He was not a director of prayer. He was a field rep. But then I kept asking the Lord, prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit means a lot for it. So who do we choose? And he led us to choose a man who has really demonstrated that prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit is at the heart of all that he does. Over the past two years, if you observe as a fellowship in terms of corporate prayer, we have prayed together more than any other time I have known in this fellowship. I'm saying praying together. As for individually, I can't talk for you. I can talk for myself. Talk for yourself on your individual prayer. But as for corporate prayer, over the last two years, we have prayed together on a corporate basis more than ever before. Every single night leading to the World Convention, we gathered at 12 and prayed until 1. And we have kept up at it till today. If you look at our first Wednesday prayer meetings, it used to be just 
largely first Wednesday prayer meeting, but with no fasting. Even though we had a day of fasting program, now it is three days of prayer, lead, uh, three days of fasting leading to the first Wednesday prayer session. Once again, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for you. I don't live with you. I do not necessarily agree with everything the prayer team says. For instance, they speak in very ecclesiastical language. We are declaring a fast from this time to that time. I don't agree with that. We have people of various ages among us. We have agreed together we want to fast. Remind them that we have agreed that we are fasting from Monday to Wednesday. But as for a declaration from the ironic throne, I don't agree with that. Some will fast because of their strength from morning to 12. Some will fast as to 4. Some will fast up to six. Some will not drink water. Some will drink water. It is not the severity. It is the commitment to do what the person can do that matters. It's very important. At 82, Daniel fasted by eating no sweet food. He didn't say, I didn't eat. At 82, he would have gone to the other side very quickly if he had made the mistake of taking on a certain fast. So let us recognize that and encourage people to fast as they should. And the Lord will bless us. Amen. I believe that the pillar of prayer which has been put in place will yield a great fruit going forward. I can't tell you the time, but if we just continue doing this, it will come beyond measure. We are dealing with 8.2 billion people in the world, out of which 2 billion are Christians. Did I say are Christians? Out of which 2 billion say they are Christians. <laughs> Whether they are Christians, I can't guarantee for them. If you arrange those who don't say they are Christians, Shoulder to shoulder in six lines, they will reach the moon and they will still be surplus. The unbelievers in the world today, if you arrange them shoulder to shoulder, they will stretch to the moon and they will still be surplus. So it needs nothing short of the Holy Spirit's revival among us for us to be able to reach all these people before the Lord returns. And the sick Secret has to be prayer. The next quadrant over there is revitalizing their brand. When Full Gospel started in Ghana, there were not too many charismatic churches. In fact, quite a number of the churches that are what they are today are so because they borrowed or had beginnings in full gospel. Today, we have so many independent churches that you can't count them. And some are sitting in the first heaven, some in the second heaven, some in the seventh heaven, some are helicopter church of Christ. You can't count them. <laughs> so people come into our fellowship a number of them, they are Christians, but they have already imbibed quite a lot of what is not full gospel from their church. And because full gospel has to do with Christianity, they walk in and think that I am a mature Christian. I can speak in tongues. I can do this. I'm gifted. So I can just begin to operate. No. There are petty, petty things that distinguish us. And our focus is on reaching out to people. 
So you visit our chapters today and you have quite a lot who have brought in what they carried from their churches. And it must not be allowed to continue. It's an uphill tax, but it will be one. What are we trying to do? We are trying to say that at the very least, the universal call of full gospel is each person should bring two people as members every year. If we all kept to that, it means that every year we will be three times what we were in the last year. Because if each person is bringing two people. But we have said, can each person bring even one person? That will mean that we will double. Can I see who has brought a person as a member here today? Can I see among you? As at today, can I see? So how are we reaching out to people? For the whole 365 days, you should target some people, invite them. They may be five, they may be ten. I believe by the end of the year, you will have at least one of them deciding to be a member. The ideal thing is that both should be unbelievers who have come to accept the Lord, or one is an unbeliever who has come to accept the Lord, and the other is a Christian you have brought in so that they can be helped to have the vision of evangelism, to awaken and reach out to people before the Lord returns. What you are not allowed to do is to bring in two Christians. Because we are not moving people from churches. Friends, we are in September. We still have September October, November, December. I believe if you set your mind to it, the Lord can help you bring one person. The second thing is that, I'll skip some of them. We are introducing a standard operating procedure. It is a small booklet, a very small booklet. And we expect everybody to have a copy. It captures the essentials of what we do in full gospel at every intervention. So if you just have it in your packet, it can go into your coat packet. It means that anytime you want to do something full gospel and you are at sea because you are lost, if you open to the right page, you will get the facts that will help you know how to start. We are trying to raise up leaders because the problem at our chapters, first and foremost, is leadership. When Franklin spoke, it was clear that if you have the right leader, the chapter will stay, the chapter will grow. It doesn't have to be a rich chapter. We have chapters in certain towns where People have said, this is my hotel. The accommodation is available for your use anytime. Don't pay anything. If you invite any number of people, we we'll feed them with breakfast or lunch or dinner. Don't pay anything. And they still can raise 10 people. So it's not money. It's leadership. And so we are trying to raise leaders bit by bit. Leaders who will know what our mission is and focus on it in practical terms. We have tried the lead, Daniel Leadership Pro, uh, Development Program. We brought out two batches of leaders. I'm in charge of uh, four of them now. The most important part is the mentorship part. 
so that working with me, they can observe me, they can attend uh, the meetings where I minister and observe and listen. And I believe some of what I do, not that I'm better than them, I just have had an advantage. It will rub off on them. A chapter invited me at Akuse, can you get us uh, someone to speak for us? I just chose one of the mentorees in the Daniel Leadership Pro Program, say, you will speak for me at Akuse on the fourth term. And the other three offered, we will join him and we'll pray with him and then we will go and minister and come back. That is practical training. We are not talking of certificates. We are talking of how people can practically learn to minister and be used of God. The other side is our mission field, that quadrant on the right. We have people outside this fellowship who needs the touch of the Lord who need to be one for Christ, who need to be discipled. And we are doing it in various ways, in schools and colleges, at the beach, as RBP has mentioned, at the prisons, at the maternity wards, at various places. Just that we have to balance this and that. Because if you are a parent and you are so much on fire for the Lord that you are always outside working for the Lord, you will come home to find out that your house is on fire. So we have to balance the two carefully. And I will create very healthy people here. They are doing well and our chapters are dying. I sincerely think that we should refocus and equally help some chapters to really be on their feet, and especially the emerging leaders' chapters and our youth, so that we can have a future. If we don't invest vigorously in that, we don't have a future. Because if you look at us, many of us are on the good side of 60, 70, 80. Who is taking over? I also think that what we do here must be sustainable. For instance, I don't believe that we should be seated in Accra and working at every corner of Ghana. <laughs> it is not sustainable. I believe that we should develop people like us at each region so that they can replicate what we are doing in Accra at their individual places. No matter how efficient a schools and colleges project is in Accra, the schools and colleges in Ghana are so many that by the time you reach them, in fact, we would have gone to heaven, come back, gone to heaven, come back, gone to heaven, come back, and settle here on earth with you without you having finished your job. So we need to develop or devolve competency to the regions. It is not acceptable to seek to use Accra as a launching point to do everything. Every region can reach schools if they are taught and they are actually reaching them. Every region can reach fishermen in their region. Every region can, if they are taught. So we should think about that. I had an illiterate football coach. He didn't know much English, but he understood football to some extent. So when you are running with the ball, running, running with the ball, you would get angry because he understands that if football is played well, the ball can run faster than you. So don't be running with it. 
just kick it to the appropriate person and to go faster than you. So when you are running with the ball, you say, at once in the ball. You know. <laughs> you know. So please, our job is to develop leaders across every region so that what the ladies are doing can be replicated in the region. What the schools are doing can be replicated in the region. And you only go once in a while to support them or to re-emphasize teaching. But you can't go from Accra everywhere in Ghana and be effective. It can't work. Please, am I making sense? The top part is we call, what we call the impact. So if we are counting what we have done, we should not just count the members here. We should also count what we have done over there. Because the two are both impact. What is below is the engine room that enables us to have the impact. The two below are the engine room that enables us to have impact, if it is based on prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Countries may count their impact differently, but I think if we are counting our impact, we should be this and that. And my philosophy, I may be wrong, is that not everybody must be a member of full gospel. That's my philosophy. Forgive me if I'm wrong. If you are to be a member of full gospel, then in the chapter where you find yourself, I don't care where the chapter meets, but wherever they are meeting, you should be able to pay for a meal there and then pay for somebody else because we are reaching people. If you can pay for only yourself, then it's not the right chapter for you. Go to a chapter where you can pay for yourself and pay for somebody else. Because for now, that is basically what we do. Even if it is marketplace outreach, we still have to feed people. If it is eyebot, we still have to feed people. So if you are in a chapter where you can't eat there and come on your own voluntarily to eat with your wife, then perhaps you are at the wrong chapter. I was field rep of a chapter where the, the, the outreach meeting was on a diet of Benku and tilapia. For them, that was it. Whether it was a right thing now, I don't know, because they have disappeared. <laughs> they never took tea. They never took any continental meal. It was just Banku and tilapia. It was frightening because you would go there and you are met with a whole bunch of white balls, some tilapia, and an invitation of a few naughty flies that will try to come over to invade the place. You know, I just think that a chapter should be decent. Look, let me tell you something. The problems of this country I bar and large not caused by the people at Choco. They are caused by those of us in white color jobs, sitting on corporate boards and in leadership and at the governmental and the higher levels who are killing this country with corruption. It is we, 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 we. It's not the Choco people. The Lord is sending full gospel, apart from anything else, the ministry we are doing, to reach out to these people. If full gospel can reach out to these people, no other entity in this country is well placed to meet them. And so we are seeding them out to the lodges, and it is wrong. No matter how costly hotels may be, we will meet at other places. We will meet at restaurants. We will meet at any place we choose. But we must still meet at hotels because that is where these classes of people will ever come to. I mean every bit of it. Someone sees our award ceremony and says, I want to join Full Gospel. 
and he's CEO of, I can't mention the name because I don't know how far this is going. As for the corruption, I'll mention it because it's true everywhere. Yeah, I, I can go anywhere and answer. <laughs> but this one is a private conversation, so I can't mention it. I want to join full gospel. Then at the award ceremony, a member of parliament says, comes to me and says, wow, I want to join full gospel. Sometimes the challenge is we are not careful about the mix of membership in a particular chapter. Because when you put father and son in one class, it will be difficult for any of them to talk. The father is afraid to talk in case he makes a mistake and the son laughs at him. And the son is looking at the father and he can't talk. But when you put all fathers in one class, they will talk. When you put all children in one class, they will talk. The problem with many of our chapters is it's a mixed group of people. So some people come there and they can't talk. I brought a high-level person who flies sick people to Germany. He and the wife, they were highly disturbed. I brought him to my chapter. And when he saw the people around and how we were praying, he said he won't come again. So we are trying to create silo chapters to take on board some of these. We may be wrong, but we are learning as we go along. Strengthening the enablers is about money. It's about resources. It's about databases. It's about vehicles. And we are trying to address this. But let me say a little bit about money. Because if you are a leader and you are afraid to talk about money, in an economy that is based on money, and every economy in the world is based on money. Even Jesus needed a treasure. So I can never say I wouldn't talk about money. You are doing extremely well. And God bless you for the wholehearted support that we have been receiving from you at the national office. I'm honest about it. Until I came to service I didn't know the level of deep sacrifices that people are making across the board to keep us going. And may the Lord, not that may, and the Lord will bless each of you beyond your understanding. It won't end with you. It will go to your children's children's children up to a thousand generations. That's how far the memory of the Lord will go. Amen. There will be grandchildren of yours, great-grandchildren who will deserve poverty, but the Lord will not allow them to be poor because you laid down a certain foundation for them. I sincerely believe that. So sometimes I'm discouraged when somebody works and say, uh, I'm paid nothing. It's not true. You are paid. God will never accept your free labor. He will always pay you in one way or the other. Amen. Now let me come to the love letter, the good part. Is that our dues must be dollarized. Do you know why? Because we are living in an economy where at the time that we said 240 CDs, it was $30. Can 240 CDs get you $30 today? No. It can't get you the $30. So we struggle. I'm not paid. Every week I come to the office, at least I must spend a thousand something to buy petrol to come to the office every week. I'm not paid. My wife ensures that I carry my food in my school bag and I bring it and eat. So I'm not asking for money to make me comfortable. 
but that is the reality of it. We have workers, and we must not make them feel like they are the poorest people in the, on earth. We must not do that. It's not a good testimony. So somewhere along the line, someday, if you hear the treasurer saying, we must try and dollarize our dues so that we never, we hardly ever change it. Even dollars depreciate. But we wouldn't come to you regularly. Every year when the dollar changes, we'll peg it at that and just sit down. And you say, oh, this is strange. It's not strange because life members are already paying their dues in dollars. Whatever the dollar is, is what they pay. So it's nothing strange. But just to allow us so that we don't come to you again and again and it makes you look as if this man, all that he's interested in is money. It's not true. <laughs> the last point, which is also part of the engine room to lift up the two areas, is our volunteers and our employees. At least this year, we managed to have the first annual award ceremony. It did not go badly. By the grace of God, it went well. And we even have the small surplus out of it. That means our money did not disappear into it. Whatever money we put into it, we recovered and had a small surplus. So we are doing it largely for free. That's what it means. And next year, I believe that from the learning points, it will even be better. It will go to a larger place, we will bring people, and then uh, many of them may opt to be members, and many of them may understand us better and will recognize the right people in this country as well, without fear. Because even for the little that we did, there were memos, uh, is it anti-government, is it this, that, that. I don't know any politician by name. The truth is what we will always say. That is all. You can please everybody. Having done that, however, we have realized that we have a group of people called ambassadors. They have been appointed as ambassadors. But we don't even know them. How many of you have seen an FGBMFI ambassador before? And where did you see him? Can you help me? <laughs> and how did you um, identify he was an ambassador? Because he does not have a pin. He does not have a, a cloth. Nothing. So we want to formalize that. And then spell out their roles properly and let you know them, and they will perform certain functions. Largely ceremonial, because they have a lot of experience they can benefit us with. And finally, we are also repositioning the life members. If you are a life member, ask yourself, what do you receive apart from your pin and the name? It must be more than that. There must be some benefits. There must be some assignment you are carrying as a life member because you are showing a certain commitment. And committees are working on all this to get them in place. So this is the gist of what I am saying. There is a lovely refrain about women and the fact that uh, they are the most beautiful in the fellowship. And they have brought most of us, but the fellowship is predominantly a male fellowship. When I say this, Half of my quotation mark girlfriends immediately scatter. Please forgive me. I'm just speaking the truth. And we will help understand it better. In our SOP, we will have an orientation, a new orientation program. It will involve orientation not only in the four four tens, but also orientation about full gospel, which we have already begun their orientation about our doctrinal statements and code of conduct. We have it in full gospel, but we have not been implementing it. You must not become a member until you have subscribed to our doctrinal statement and our code of conduct. Plus, there will be a teaching session on the role of ladies in the fellowship so that we are not confused. So this is it. Thank you very much uh, for being with me. God bless you.
I think we can do it better for our national president. So after our national president has shared his vision and his position paper for our fellowship, I think by now most of you would have some questions to ask on this. So if the microphone is around, anyone who wants to ask a question, please just raise your hand. We'll pass the mic to you. We'll take the first three questions and then the national president can respond. We'll probably do about two rounds of that. So any questions? Or contribution. questions or is everybody totally confused by these four quadrants and cannot ask any questions okay so we've got a hand over there can we pass the mic over to her let me say something before you begin did you say the national president is the one to answer the questions no uh, are very able my lieutenants are specialists. <laughs> I'm a generalist. <laughs> so if I know any area more than them, then it's not true. They know each area better than me. Yeah. OK. So that's been clarified. But we'll still take the questions for the national team. Thank you. Since there doesn't seem to be many questions, can I ask three in one? Please do. <laughs> My first question is just, uh, maybe I'm ignorant, but uh, dollarizing our dues, will it be within the law? Because I know some time ago, uh, the government uh, spoke against that, that we shouldn't dollarize the city. Mm -hmm. Payments should be in the city, and as a fellowship, will it be right for us to do something against the law? Again, I say I'm ignorant, so. Sorry, you, um, you didn't introduce yourself. Normally what happens before you ask questions, you introduce yourself okay, and sorry. what chapter you come from. My name is Sylvia Henson Benning. Okay. I'm a life member of city chapter. Okay. I'm the first ladies coordinator of the city chapter. Um, so that's my first, my first I can issue. answer that one for you, even though I'm not on the national team. I don't think our national president actually said we'll be paying our fees in dollars. He said we will be dollarizing our dues, which means that it would have a dollar amount, but we will pay it in CDs. So depending on what happens in terms of the rate, we'll pay that amount. So if our fees are $100, for example, and the rate is 15 Ghana CDs, we'll pay 1005 Yes, if the rate falls down to 14, we'll pay 1,004. Yes, my question still stands. Mm -hmm. Is it within the law to dollarize it? That's all. I'm ignorant, so teach me, please. OK, please my, ask your other two questions. My second uh, issue, I want to call it issue. Uh, we have many new members joining our chapters all the time. And um, we are all supposed to learn the ALTS. We should know what the principles are, the concepts in full gospel. And uh, I was away for a while, and I came back, and I see that some things are being done differently, uh, even in my own chapter, and some issues have been misrepresented. So. How often are we going to uh, teach the ALTS? Who is supposed to do it? Is it the director of training or the field rep or the chapters are supposed to take these things up uh, themselves? That's my second 
Um, sorry, at 70, uh, 74, I've forgotten my third question. When I remember. Thank you very when much. I remember, I'll ask. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions to add before I go to the national team? Thank you. My name is Francois Say from Ibri Chapter. So Baba Mama made mention of SOP. I'd like to know the timelines they are working with the SOP. We should expect the SOP's timelines. Okay, I think Aunt Sylvia has remembered her third question, so we can take that one as well. It's a third issue, and I think the ladies are going to be very happy with that. We call ourselves the layman's movement, and uh, we stand on the uh, passage in Joel, that in the latter days, your sons and daughters will prophesy, they will dream dreams. In, in other words, the work that full gospel is doing it's not only for the men, it's for the women as well. And I thought that even at the very beginning, the very first meeting, there was a woman, Rose Shakarian. And I believe that the men's wives were part of the group. But the, the president has just said that it's a men's fellowship. What I have known all along is that we don't put women in executive positions. And, and I, as a, a gender expert, accept that for the sole reason that if you give women a chance, they will take over. And we don't, <laughs> we don't want that to happen. We see it in the churches. <laughs> So we are happy to do what we are doing, but when it's formally stated like that, it hurts. It hurts us because we are part of this. If all the women were to leave, this group will collapse. It's a fact because men often can't hold things together. <laughs> we, need, we need the women's presence. No, it's serious. Look at this place. There are more women than men. If we leave, this, this whole thing will collapse. So please recognize us. Don't make those statements. It hurts badly. Thank you. We'll answer the questions. I'll begin with our leader, the national president. I believe Sylvia is talking to the converted. <laughs> and she did not hear me well. But being above 70, you are forgiven. I say it's predominantly a man's fellowship. And I'm not even picking it from myself. I'm picking it from your ladies' rights up. Most of us men were brought by you. And sincerely, without the ladies, this fellowship will not be what it is today. I've acknowledged it more than 100 times at various places. So those who know me know what I'm talking about. We want as many ladies as possible, but we want men to be more. That's all. You know. But on a lighter side, just to let you appreciate what I'm saying. The ladies had a, a, a ladies' breakfast meeting. Eh? Convention, sorry. And they had a, a breakfast meeting to go along with it as the climax or at the end of it. I was supposed to go to East Legon where I had brought uh, two members and they were being pinned, so I had to pass there and just take part in the pinning to assure them that I did not bring them there to discard them. Then I rushed to the ladies' uh, breakfast. I was a little bit late. 
when it ended, the ladies, uh, at the end of it, we sang, is it a banner song? Yeah. And then we were exchanging greetings and hugging. Uh, Sylvia approached me, and she extended her hand. And I said, no, I don't want a hand. I want a hug. <laughs> he said, you want a hug? Okay, you can have three of them. <laughs> so I had three hugs. Please, we appreciate you ladies. Please, we need you all the time. But we never want the situation where the ladies are more than the men because we'd have gone full circle. And you can help bring us a lot of the men. So thank you for the good work. Okay, there was a question as well on the SOP timelines. Um, who's gonna take this one? Good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, the, the SOP is almost complete. I want to believe that, God willing, by the third quarter, uh, fourth quarter, it will be out. So, uh, let's be looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, I think um, and Sylvia had a question as well about the use of the ALTS. Um, gentlemen, which of you wants to answer that? Okay, so... Um, that is why we've tried to put uh, together the medley themes. Chapters are supposed to draw programs based on our literature, the ALTS, the Ultimate Dimension, um, um, Vision Intensified, and so on. And that is why it is important that any chapter, when you draw a program, the field rep must give approval. He must look at the content and must look at the speakers and give approval that these are the needs, these are the things that will help this particular chapter. Every, all chapters are unique. They have different needs because a chapter may be needing something probably on how uh, to invite or chapter operations in a certain particular area of chapter operations. Another chapter may not be needing exactly the same thing. So it is important that our field rest ensure that they take, uh, they take more interest in the chapter's affairs so that they help them to draw the program that will suit each particular chapter so that those needs, the needs of the chapter can be met. Some of the needs can be met through the um, material in the ALTS. There are some that can be found in the leadership, um, what's the name of the book? Leadership effectiveness and so on. So there are materials that we can use as chapters to draw our programs plus the monthly themes that we have added so that our chapters can, the very various needs of our chapters can be met. So it needs our chapter press executives or the president and their executives to do more identify the needs of their chapters, and with the supervision and help of the field rep, be able to draw programs that will address the needs of each chapter. Thank you. OK, I think and Sylvia's last question, or the first question, was still on the dollarization. And even though I thought I had given a response, um, her concerns still stand. What she wanted to know was whether it was legal for us to price in dollars and pay in CDs. All I can say about that is I will get back to you on that. I believe it's fine, but I will get back to you on that. Thank you. So um, we've still got another five or six minutes. If we've got a couple of questions, please, this, this is your forum. All right, can we um, ask them now for the team? 
So um, there's a hand up over there. Can we have a mic? And also um, Nana as well has got his hand up. So those will be our last two questions before we end the session. Can we have a mic, please, for them? The mic? Somebody is here. Oh, I see. Okay. Please, so my be name three. is Rose Jifa. I'm a summer chapter. Uh, I heard that our mandate is to invite uh, at least two people, one unbeliever and then uh, the other person a believer. Um, and I also heard that not everybody or invitee or first-timer is a full gospel material. My uh, focus is on the unbeliever. If an unbeliever is invited and has, found, has been found uh, not a material of a full gospel, what can be done? Is it not embarrassment? Uh -huh. I, so I want you to help me. Thank you, Auntie Rose. Um, I think there was another hand up over there for Auntie. So can you? Yes. OK. My name is Nakali. I'm also from City Chapter. Auntie Sylvia is my mentor. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Um, my interest is in what the president started with, <clears throat> bringing our churches' practices into the chapters. Uh, we always talk about it, but it's still there. So I want to suggest that we have to put in effort so that we know what the full gospel stands for. We have languages that we speak. One is advanced, we don't speak retreats. But you see some people, they, 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 will, they think it's the same. And also, we also say that we are laymen, and that we, we, laymen are used to do their work. But you go somewhere, and some prophets and prophetess have taken over the chapter. And because, because we are women, especially me, I cannot go and talk. Uh, we need the men to go and do those corrections and the trainings so that we don't bring, uh, I don't know whether the word is, is by churchianity, like churches things into the chapters. And also when we joined, we were, we, there was a manual called Chapter Operation Manual. And when you read, Everything is inside. How to be MC, how to give short testimony, how to do that. It's there. Chapter Operation Manual. It's a long book before the ALTS. And we're asked to uh, read them and to learn them. But these days, it's not there. I remember recently, about two weeks ago, my, I've moved from... Uh, my house is not far from my chapter. So when they are doing the online before I joined them, but this, they needed me to come in person and I didn't want to come. But one of the young men said, Auntie, now please come. We don't know anything. We are in the chapter. Nobody is teaching us, so please come. I was going to talk about MPUs. All of a sudden, everywhere, MPU, MPU, MPU. Full gospel doesn't only do MPUs. At least I know four. We do the fire team. We do the MPUs. We do the uh, city storm. We do the air lifting. When we came, we were taught these four outreaches. And plus the breakfast meeting, which is a major breakfast. So that thing broke my heart, and I stopped everything and came. And came to talk about the MPU. Already, now the ladies of the Accra Greater Re uh, Region 2, we organized uh, MPU for every chapter to help them get ladies, because there's only one lady there. But when we were going, our national coordinator advised that we should win everybody, whether man or woman, we should win them. So we went to do MPU, I think it's in, in July. We went to Ebri, and we had a successful MPU. The president is here. The president joined in, all of us. When it was even raining, we were on the streets, and we won them. So the Lord, Holy Spirit brought the souls, and we won them. And they attended the session. And now I'm hearing a testimony that 
Some of them have joined the chapter. So we are grateful. So this is what I want to thank you. We'll just take another um, question from Nana and then a quick response before we move on to praise and worship. Uh, Nana Bray is my name. Uh, Kufudia, National Director. Eastern Region. <laughs> National Director for Eastern Region. My question is, if a member exhibits unacceptable behavior, which can actually drive away people from the fellowship, what do we do with such people? Okay, thank you. So we've got three questions, one from Auntie Rose, one from Auntie Nakale, and one from Nana. So gentlemen, um, who is going to take um, the first question from Auntie Rose? Okay. Yeah, in our super old book and other books, we have been directed to three key universal strategies in full gospel. One is on membership, that each year every member should bring two new members not invite people to breakfast meeting. Yes, you can invite 10 of them, but at least two of them should become members. So when you are inviting, you are not encouraged to invite only Christians because we don't want to just be moving people from their churches. When they come, we'll add value to it, but it does not help the Great Commission. So we want you to also invite unbelievers so that they'll hear the gospel and either accept or reject it. It is when they accept that they can be members. If they don't accept, they cannot be members. So anybody coming in must have accepted the Lord as his savior and as his Lord. And then I'm saying the next thing is anybody who has accepted the Lord at the chapter in my view, it's not written anywhere. Not all of them can be members at that chapter. Because the chapter may be meeting at Fiesta. The uh, meal there may cost 200 CDs. He cannot pay for the meal there and pay for another person's meal. So you'll be straining the person. Anytime you talk of contribution towards evangelism because you are doing it in your environment, he may not. However, he can go to another chapter where they are largely using MPOs or FTOs or can use him in other mission work and still manage him. So he will be better at that chapter. So the rule is two members per person, not two invitees. So. To get two members, you, might, you must invite about 10 or so people. So two members per year. If we all had two members per year, then we'll be three times what we were last year. But we are saying at the very least, each person should bring one member. That means you must target about five people to invite. And from experience, we know if you invite five different people, one is likely to stay. Or all of them, or four, or three, I don't know. But at least you'll get one. That's what we know from experience. So, Rose, have I answered you? It's members you are bringing. But don't go and invite only Christians. We like them, but don't bring only Christians because we seek to evangelize, to reach men in all nations for Christ. So bring an unbeliever so that you hear the gospel. And when he accepts, we can consider him for membership. Thank you. And all of this is in our materials. 
super alt, how to increase your leadership effectiveness, and then uh, new wave of revival, and so on and so forth. Please, the SOP is a better version than the chapter operating manual. We have added more things to it than the former chapter operating manual that you have. It's far better, twice better, I can assure you. So we are bringing it back in an enhanced form for you, but it's still portable. Um, Nana asked a question on what we do about unacceptable behavior. Um, Mr. President, will you take this? Or Mr. Roxon? Unacceptable behavior? Any of them. Any of them. So, gentlemen, I think... All right, Mr. Roxon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC. Nana, rightly so. If you heard President speaking earlier on, he did indicate that we have amongst our literature the code of conduct and the doctrinal statement. And that going forward will ensure that any member coming, anybody coming into membership must subscribe wholly to the 10-point doctrinal statement. It's something that used to be there that has been left undone we will want to introduce it and enforce it. The code of conduct also is available and it tells us what to do when anybody puts up an unacceptable behavior. Because we have relaxed that over a period of time, what we we'll say is that in the very near future, when we introduce that back into the system with enforcement, we will have answers to what type of behavior what answers the conditions and the uh, materials provide for us by which we can address it. So yes, unacceptable behaviors are not acceptable. For now, we have relaxed our own rules and laws. So we may have to address it the biblical way. If we have to go to the person and individual, talk to him and see if it will correct. If we have to bring two people to him to come and correct it, if it's not working, do we have to bring entire church to it? Then the Bible tells us what to do next. Thank you very much. But the point is that the code of conduct and the doctrinal statement are coming from January next year. Even if you are an old member, we will give it to you. You should sign that you agree with the doctrinal statement and the code of conduct. If you don't sign, then we can't accept your money. We, we have to bring order quickly, otherwise we'll be left behind. Yeah. So everybody will have to sign, even the old members who are renewing. Please sign. Because if you don't agree with us on the doctrines, then why should we be sitting together? And if you are not willing to subscribe to behavior that is Christ-honoring, why should we accept your money? It talks about things like gossiping, about friends, and a whole lot of issues. So you read it. If you are afraid, don't sign. If you want to join us, please sign. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, our MVP has another word, final word, before we close. I think I'm being prompted within to talk about a very important aspect of our meeting this moment. It's about our membership drive. As it's been repeated again and again, Jesus made it very clear, go and make what? Disciples. So it's not about the invitation, more importantly, about how we help those who have been invited to stay in the chapters. We are proud, some of the chapters, we are counting the numbers. But if you go to the chapters, the people are not there. It is not for the chapter alone. You who have invited a friend or somebody new, we are supposed to stand with that person. We are supposed to make sure that that person comes to stay. That is the bottom line. So the great attribution rate we are experiencing now is because those who have brought the people, 
we are not supporting them to stay. And I pray that from today, we must take a second look at how we bring people in. Jesus said that they must come and our fruit must what? Remain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sedofia. Please, a round of applause for our national team. So now, as we end this session, I'm going to invite the band to take us through a praise and worship session um, so that we can also stretch our legs and...